It's Sharmini Pires, and welcome to this edition of Global Warning at the Real News Network. The extreme weather events associated with a warming planet is here to stay if we follow the consistency of the record-setting trends to date. According to NASA, July and August were the 11th straight record-breaking months this year. Just so you, our audience, knows, we state these alarming records repeatedly at The Real News to alert viewers of the gravity of the problem we are dealing with. To make our case, let's take up Super Typhoon Maranti, as it has hit Taiwan with winds up to 185 miles an hour, expected to rise to 225 miles an hour as it makes its way along Hong Kong, mainland China, and Japan. Maranti surprised many by rapidly intensifying to a Category 5 storm in just 24 hours. Typhoon intensity in Asia has increased markedly over the last four decades, fueled by ocean warming. So what is to be done about all of this? Well, we are going to take up that question with our next guest, Angelina Galiteva. She is the founder and chair of the Board for Renewables 100% Policy Institute. Thanks for joining us, Angelina. It's a pleasure. Angelina, uh, your organization, 100% Renewable Energy, uh, just hosted a delegation coming from Brazil. Uh, in spite of all the political turmoil that's going on, they have signed the uh, Paris Agreement, and they're curious about what uh, California holds in terms of a model for their implementation. Uh, give us a sense of what their inquiries were about, and uh, give us a sense of um, what you had to offer. Well, as you know, the Paris Agreement focused on climate change, greenhouse gas, and mitigating these extreme events that you referred to in the introduction in terms of typhoons, in terms of extreme weather, in terms of resiliency, and it also would have an economic impact. And ratifying this agreement for Brazil also meant that they're going to join all of the other countries in combat combating climate change and making sure that we have a plan on how we address these issues. And of course, one of the biggest portions and contributors to climate change is energy, all forms of energy, how we produce our electricity, the fuels that we use to heat and cool and run industries, and the fuels that we use to drive our cars. So electrifying all of the sectors and electrifying them with renewable energy and a growing percentage of renewable energy is important. And this is actually a continuation of California's interactions with Brazil through the U.S. State Department, which started last year, where we presented the California solution for climate change and California's cutting-edge climate policies as examples that could be utilized by most anybody around the globe, of course, with certain adjustments. They're very technologically based. They're policy based. We can learn from each other. And Brazil was very interested. And this is the second delegation coming to California. It's a high level government, NGO, regulators, and utilities, um, almost 30 people here, trying to find out what California is doing, what our experience is, meeting with universities, meeting with utilities, meeting with high tech companies such as Apple and Solar City, meeting with uh, integrators of renewable energy, learning about what the opportunities are, so that we could have a program of where we exchange relevant experience and benefit from each other's progress so we can transition faster to this reality of 100% renewable energy, which will hopefully mitigate and curb the global warming that's occurring at a very alarming pace. Angelina, California's Governor Jerry Brown just signed two very important climate bills into law last week. Can you talk about the significance of those uh, bills and what it has to add to Bill SB 350 and uh, whether you think this is the right direction for California in terms of curtailing fossil fuels? 
course. And Governor Brown is very, very dedicated to making sure that climate change is addressed, that this is a moral imperative, and it is something that we're all in together and we have to solve. And he certainly walks the talk and takes a leadership approach to making sure that climate is tackled on a very practical and pragmatic level. And the, sign the signing and extension of SB 32, which was the law passed in 2006, requiring that we reach CO2 levels of 1990 by 2020, is actually something that California is going to achieve. What happened a few days ago on September 8th was making that goal even more aggressive of reducing greenhouse gases to 40 percent below 1990 levels by 2030, which is going to be an even more impressive goal that we have to reach. And of course, SB 350, which is 350, the 350s, 50 percent reduction in use of energy, so 50 percent improvement in energy efficiency, 50 percent reduction in the use of fossil fuels, and 50 percent renewable electricity for the state is what this law calls for. So it's increasing our renewable electricity from what is currently about 28, 29 percent to 50 percent by 2030. We will meet our 20 goal, 2020 goals of 30 percent by 2020, and we certainly will reach the 50 percent. Increasing uh, energy efficiency is going to be very critical because that is important, but even more so the transportation sector, because 40 percent of California's greenhouse gas emissions are connected to transportation. So electrifying the transportation sector, making sure that we have mass transit options, making sure that we've got alternative fuels to power our cars, and especially trucks, whether it's biodiesel or hydrogen or some other form of clean renewable fuel, is going to be a very critical step necessary for us to meet these ambitious SB 32 goals of 40 percent below 1990 levels. And a governor has made this commitment, and of course there are certain people that have said that this may influence California's comp comp competitiveness in terms of the global economy, that our environmental goals may somehow impede our economic development, which has not turned out to be the case so far. California has progressively grown. Jobs have actually grown, and manufacturing has not left the state. And we're now the sixth largest economy in the world and going strong. So you can have a booming economy and a strong environmental policy because we all live and work and play um, in the same environment. And having Los Angeles be one of the cleaner cities and not having to deal with smog and asthma, of course, benefits everybody. So we want to make sure that we transition to this clean economy and show the world how it can be done in a cost-effective manner, optimizing all of the assets that we have, not having stranded investments, and making sure that we provide an environment where cutting edge technology can actually succeed and be implemented on an escalated fashion so that we move very quickly towards a cleaner and a greener electricity grid and indeed an overall energy infrastructure. Right, um, give us a sense of uh, when you say electrifying, um, uh, doesn't it also take a great deal of energy to electrify a, a grid? Uh, give us some of the technical uh, background to this that is required in terms of our understanding to understand, to see whether uh, California is really proposing a solution that other states can learn from. Well, let's say electrifying the electricity grid with 100% renewable energy. Right now, the goal is 50% renewable energy. But keep in mind that California does not count large hydropower into the mix of renewable energy. And we don't also don't count rooftop um, so systems that have been put and, and are being installed at a very fast pace. Actually, the last number I heard was between six to 8,000 rooftops every single month going in California, which is another very large portion of renewable energy coming on the grid. So that 50% is technically 70 or 75% if you count the hydro and the rooftop solar that's coming in. And that is something that can happen with balancing the grid, making sure that you understand the resources that you have, that although renewables are extremely reliable, because we know the sun will shine and we know the wind will blow, 
um, we need to, we know that it's not going to be 100% of the time. So we need to be able to balance those resources with power that is available, which means we need to have more geothermal, more hydropower that we can count on. Certainly storage is going to be very important. Flexible resources, such as being able to ramp up and down the new batteries and new storage technologies are going to be critical. And of course, an opportunities for customers to participate in the new economy, because if you have a solar system and you've got storage in your home and you're driving an electric car, if the grid sends you a signal, we have a shortage, we'd like to be able to drain your batteries and we'll certainly pay you for it. All of a sudden, your car, your storage system, your home become a money-making opportunity, which was never the case before. So customers are inc increasingly interested in being able to participate in this new energy economy and this new marketplace. So it's basically about democratizing the grid and allowing power to flow both ways, no longer just the utility supplying the customer, but the customer being able to support the grid with necessary services at peak times. So it becomes an exciting opportunity opportunity, of course, it becomes also much more complicated. We have to be able to transition very quickly from supply and demand and be able to meet those peak demands. But we believe that if we are prepared and plan for it, it is something that is infinitely doable. And if we can show that it's possible here, it can be something that others can incorporate into their energy systems and leapfrog to solutions without having to make mistakes. Angelina, in your calculations, when you project the impact of renewables um, across the globe, is it uh, possible to actually reverse some of the trends we are seeing today in terms of these extreme climate conditions? Uh, I don't know if we can reverse them. I mean, we hear conflicting scientific data of we may be past the point of no return. I'm an infinite optimist. <laughs> and I'd like to believe that we can create an environment of where we're not making it any worse, that we can curb it and certainly slow it down, and maybe over time with a concentrated global effort, reverse it. But renewables right now, because they have been so successful in how they've been developed, and because they are fossil free, they are emission free, they are fuel free, they are now very quickly with mass implementation becoming our lowest cost resource, which is an in incredible benefit because the argument is no longer, well, why should we invest in all of these expensive extravagant technologies when they're the lowest cost technologies and they're the technologies that can allow you to transition much faster because they're flexible. Renewables are the only resource that can allow a village in the Sun Belt that has never been interconnected to a grid and has no hope of having power lines be built there in the next decade because it takes a very long time to build a centralized power system to allow those people to come to the 21st century in terms of having power having industry of some kind of where people can actually work because they have the energy, having education, having access to doctors across borders. And that is a very quick solution that is an empowerment solution for children, for women, and for everybody in those, in, in those areas as well. So our moral imperative is not only to curb climate change and to have the haves and the have-nots, but to make sure that people, the two billion people that have no power right now, are empowered with renewable technologies that will not adversely affect climate, and they can actually be the ones that build the new cities of the future faster than we can over here because we've got outdated infrastructure. Angelina, uh, lots of very interesting uh, things to think about. I thank you so much for joining us today and hope to have you back very soon again. Thank you. Thank you so much. We should be optimistic. The future is green and we can build it. We've got the solutions. We've got the technologies. We need the political will and the implementation schedules. And we're getting there by signing all these treaties. So I'm optimistic. Well said. I thank you very much. And thank you for joining us on The Real News Network.